Welcome to Electronic Music Life. I'm your host, James Locksmith, where we interview inspiring guests who provide insight into the electronic music industry, breaking down business, the creative process, wellness, lifestyle, and culture. We'll reveal practical tools and tangible support on electronic music entrepreneurship and how to overcome its obstacles. I'm so pleased to be back with a new reboot of my podcast. To kick things off, I've gone back into the vault of previous unreleased conversations with guests from around the world. What I found from revisiting the archive was something special and interesting to me. The where we were and where we are now aspect of artists and music creators, which is something for all of us to be proud of and recognize no matter where you are on your journey, you may not see it, and believe it or not, there has been progress from a time that was bleak and dark for most of us. Many have also recognized there was so much gain from pausing from what we had and knew how. In this episode, I'm speaking with a dear friend, writer, editor, music historian, DJ, co-founding member of the Beirut Groove Collective, Natalie Shooter. Natalie was based in Beirut just over a decade before moving back to the UK, running parties with DJs Ernesto Shahoud, her husband and event partner, and DJ, journalist and filmmaker Jackson Allers. Together they are the Beirut Groove Collective, a travelling club night that was formed in Beirut in 2010 to bring awareness to lost gems of the Arab world, North Africa, and bring homage to UK Northern Soul, weird Italo disco, rare US funk, soul jazz, and other obscurities in between. Recorded in November 2020, Natalie and I got into her involvement in the global dance cultures of the 1970s and 1980s, Disco Heterotopia's book, which includes a chapter by her and Ernesto Shahoud on disco music and the nightlife scene in Lebanon during the Civil War. Tracing the story of early disco singles by Elias and Ziad Rabani, Ehsan al Munzer, Raja Zar, and Muhammad Jamal. It also features interviews with Ziad Rabani and Jacqueline Monroe, to name a few. We spoke about the rise of community radio in the Swana region, dancing on Zoom, and clubbing culture during the pandemic, and her contribution as a journalist in the Swana region from her early days with Time Out Beirut to her 2021 feature on Belly Dance Disco on Al Jazeera. Natalie Shuda, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me. <laughs> I'm excited to to uh, to have you on for some time now. So I remember oh. telling you all about it back in um, uh, in February when we saw each other last. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, exactly. It's amazing to see how it's uh, developed. All the guests you've had on. Thank you. For what you do. <laughs> so you've um you've moved to Scotland. Whereabouts are you now in Scotland? Well, just temporarily. Currently, uh, I'm in Aberdeen. Aberdeen okay. on the east coast. Right. Um, just quite randomly, really, ended up here. Basically, <laughs> myself and um, Ernesto, who uh, I run the Beirut Groove Collective with, uh, we came. We took basically the last flight out of Beirut back in March, I guess, just before the lockdown happened, because um, we had a few DJ gigs in the UK, in Manchester and um, Sheffield and a few other places. And so because things were like locking down in Lebanon and, you know, the government had already made an order that all nightclubs had to close, we thought we'd, just, you know, take our chances and just, <laughs> just go to the UK. Uh, and then, of course, Beirut Airport closed uh, and it's remained closed for like three, four months. So we were kind of a little bit stranded, I guess, mm. in a way. But I mean, it was also an adventure. Right. And we ended up, obviously, our gigs also got cancelled in the UK because then the UK went into lockdown. Right. And then we ended up in Nottingham for like six or seven months. Mm. And just recently we've come to Scotland. Wow. So you haven't mm. been back to Beirut since March. No, it's been ages. Right. Uh, Desperate to go back. And uh, the airports have opened up again, though, haven't they, recently? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's opened up again. But actually just today Lebanon's gone into another lockdown. Really? It's, As of today? Yeah, corona cases are rising right. there again. Okay, but, okay. Yeah. And what, what about Scotland, though? I know that uh, a lot of uh, um, the 
Europe is going through lockdowns as well. What's happening with Scotland? Have they in uh, Scotland is by region, so in England is in a full national lockdown. Yes, Scotland it depends where you are. So like the central area of Scotland is is in a higher. They have like a tier system. Um, okay. So Aberdeen is in tier two, which means a week ago the. There's like a, a funny rule in Scotland where like pubs can s- serve alcohol, but only outside. And obviously it's freezing in Scotland this time of year. Um, hmm. And now they've changed the law slightly. So you can um, serve alcohol inside with a meal until eight and then outside till 10 o'clock. Hmm. And you're not allowed to mix inside houses with other households. Hmm. But apart from that, it's not too much of a lockdown, really. Okay. Open as normal. Mm. It's changing all the time, you know. Mm-mm-mm. <laughs> yeah, well, it's hard to keep track. It's hard to keep track on because um, different p- parts of the world, are, you know, have different regulations. Uh, How but, is it in Dubai? Well, look, we're we're our cases um, have always kind of been, I guess, averaged uh, in the late, uh, like from eight hundred to. And I think we're hitting like twelve hundred cases a day, but. We don't have a lockdown, um, yeah. and but the way the city and the by government managing it, it's pretty amazing. Like the they've, they've um, I guess systems and and uh, measures are in place, you know. Yeah, and they've been pretty good at keeping it under control. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, but um, I mean, when I when I was over there, like you say, back in was February, I guess, and um, and I think. The UAE was one of the really early countries who started doing like actual Corona swab tests when mm-hmm. you come in to the country, when you fly in. So at the airport, when I came in, I had a swab test and then they right. already had quite a few like early regulations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot yeah. of other countries were really lagging behind, which I guess is why. Mm. But, so. Yeah, I mean, when we did have the, the when the, the whole world was going through the simultaneous lockdown, um, mm. it was quite like... It was really full on here as well. Like the, um, and I think during that period, they were really active and moving fast to get a lot of things in in place. You know, yeah. make, a lot of makeshift hospitals, uh, all sorts of things. So, um, yeah, I, it it's um, and and Dubai, thankfully, um, where we can kind of fly to certain places, it's not. Right. Where you can, like, we can still travel to some parts of the That's world, good. but uh, you know, I mean, I can't go back to Australia at the moment. So, um, Why? well, I can, many- I can, I can, but it's just um, there's the quarantine, and there's just like quite a, a, a substantial amount of money I've got to pay for the hotels and. Uh, right. uh, yeah. So in Australia, you're forced to go in a hotel for. Yeah, exactly, and I've got to pay for that, and and mm-hmm. so at the moment, um, but, but sorry, it ends up being very expensive. Yeah, trip. yeah. Uh, and look, but Australia's numbers are really low now, um, so they have they've kind of like really kind of protecting their borders as well, and so yeah, yeah. Now I it- um I, I'm. I'm, uh, you know, I've known you now for a decade, um, yeah, about thereabouts. So we, we, you and I, we've kind of pretty much been in the region about the same, uh, same length. Yeah, and, yeah I think yeah. so. And your, your body of work now has mostly been supporting and bringing awareness to the music, arts and culture and injustices around the region, uh, particularly the, the Levant region. Now, um, would you say now the dots are connecting throughout your time that you've been here uh, with articulating your experiences, your relationships, your journalism, DJing, digging, events, researching, all your projects? Yeah, I guess it all crosses over into one kind of general interest that I have, <laughs> yeah, yeah. which is like, um, I guess, mu- music history, like, Mm-hmm. Um, culture in the Middle East, like all of those things. Yeah, they kind of connect. So I, I've been doing lately a lot of kind of research-based articles on mm-hmm. kind of the Lebanese music scene back in the 60s and 70s. Um, myself and Anessa have just written um, a chapter on 
disco music in Lebanon during the civil war yeah. and kind of exploring I how that. Can't wait. I can't up. wait for this. <laughs> when's that, so when's that coming out? Uh, it should come out in January. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's part of, um, part of a book that's on global dance cultures. Um, it's called disco heterotopias and it's the idea of looking at like, not the, all of the kind of dance music cultures that existed all around the world at the same time that maybe didn't get the same attention that the American disco market did or the European disco market. But I think now we're in a time when like generally within DJ culture, within everything, we're starting to like celebrate all of these different amazing music cultures that exist around the world that didn't get that attention back in, back in their time. Mm. You know? And I think that's a, a lot of the, the work that I'm doing, I guess, is, is through like DJing. I'm really interested in like, in going back and like exploring some of the really great, like progressive records that were made in the region back in the 60s, 70s, 80s. Like. Sorry, is this a book that you're writing? I, I am actually planning a book on this kind of area, but no, this is, this is a chapter in just general, my area of interest. Okay. So like okay. I write off. Like here but and there. The, so like, what? The, what's actually what's coming out in January? It's a, it's the article. It's a chapter in, in a, a chapter. Book. It's a chapter in yeah. the book. And in where book. and where, where chapter where, on, on where, Lebanon and uh, disco music in the Civil War. So covering people like Isan Al Munzir, Ziad Rahbani, um, Elias Rahbani, like the brothers. all of the great mm. disco records that were made in mm. Lebanon at that time, um, and looking at some of the the nightclubs that existed as well because you know, despite the fact that Lebanon was in the middle of a civil war, like, you know, nightlife culture still continued. And there were two really big um, discotheques where people, you know, used to go and party like throughout. Mm. I mean, that was the more of a kind of, a, I guess, a richer kind of crowd. Not everybody obviously was partying through. Mm. It's interesting that you're writing this now in a, in a time where it's being more... Um, receptive and more, um, you know, the rest of the world is being aware through a time where clubs are <laughs> not <laughs> happening and, yeah. and yet we're now looking back at, you mentioned, you mentioned that um, your interest of, uh, that, that this book would feature other parts of the world as mm. well as the region, what what other countries or territories have have you studied or been doing research on? Sorry, so this book is by a, a collection of different writers from around the world, music writers and okay. academics. So a chapter on Japanese disco, something on like disco in the Soviet Union um, covers like uh, about ten different countries. Uh, there's a chapter on uh, Kenya also. So oh, wow. it's really diverse and covering like different writers who have expertise in in whichever country they're writing about so okay yeah it'd be an interesting read but yeah it's funny like you say it's ironic that <laughs> in the time when all the clubs are closed but maybe that's why because i can't <laughs> go to the club or dj in the club i can at least like read about <laughs> <laughs> so the, chap yeah. the 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 chapter that you you and ernesto have worked on will come out in january where will that be available uh, it's been published on Palgrave Macmillan, which is like um, okay. an academic publishers. Okay. Um, sorry, I'm not sure really. But I guess it'll be available online on their website. Okay. Okay. And 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 the the book is is still under um, like it's being put together at the moment. When when is there a deadline or when this book will be finished? And like, I think it should be released in January as well. Or early like the, 2021. The, the, the right. Okay. And and do you know? Is this book going to also show like uh, a lot of um, images from these territories and collections yeah, of photos really as well? As well yeah. So it's a hardcover, big documentation type, or is it like what kind of like format? It's like an is academic it? book, basically. Okay. Like, you know, okay. Music academia, let's say. Like, All right. Um, but the idea with the book is that they're trying to kind of break away from some of that like stuffiness of academia and like mm -hmm. open up to like music journalists in different places and people who have different perspectives. Cause yeah, I guess sometimes academic music writing can be, um, I don't know, kind of elitist or like just for only a very specific audience. And I think the idea is this is kind of wider than that. Mm. Well, yeah. tell me, yeah. I'm, I'm fast. I'm fascinated to learn about like your interest and fascination with the region. 
how how you got hooked as I did, like <laughs> you know, um, you yeah. So and and to sort of like bring back to that first question about uh, you know um, you know connecting the dots when you first got here. Was it just like okay? I, I know it was a, a sense of hey, I, I I know I need to be here. I'm, I'm loving this, and and then you started to kind of like find what it was, or was it was there a direction like I want to be here? I want to capture and document uh, the history, and I want to share this to the world. Does that? No, not really. It just mm. happened quite naturally. Like yeah. I came here and. Um, you know, obviously I was when, before, when I was in the UK, I was already like kind of excited to be around different music scenes and music cultures and clubbing culture and that kind of thing. And I was already collecting records. And, and so when I came to Lebanon, I was, you know, happy to, um, straight away discover this incredible music scene there and a really like tight music community generally. So Mm -hmm. it's like, I I don't know, I felt like instantly you're part of like this this big like music family, music community mm, of mm. Um, people who are just really into into their music. And I guess because it's a small, Beirut is quite a small city, you very quickly get to know everybody. Um, and yeah, I met I met Jackson, Jackson Allers, who does the Beirut Groove Collective. And I met Ernesto, who um, co-founded the Beirut Groove Collective. And, you know, who are just passionate about music and, you know, Funk, soul, yep. mm-hmm. all mm-hmm. of these kind of different music cultures, and I, I, I guess that just started like kind of I, I got involved in in their party, and I was also at the same time I was a, a writer for Time Out Beirut, and I was uh, I was like the music editor, so I was covering also right. the local mm-hmm. contemporary music scene, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like hip hop, jazz, everything. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I guess I just very quickly found. I felt like Beirut had something really special like mm. about it and that I I was just hooked straight away I wanted to to stay you know I didn't even really question it. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like uh my same same kind of uh experience when when I arrived in 2010 I met the same guys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they're, they're, they're responsible. <laughs> yeah, lots of people, exactly. <laughs> I met the same boys and and uh, they just introduced me to a lot of amazing people and, and it was just kind of like this sort of spiral. I just started to keep connecting and meeting more and more uh, amazing people and and it just kind of it kind of connected with everything else that I had, be, I had done before. So... I was, yeah, so it sounds very similar. Like we, mm-hmm, like definitely. not only like, you know, because you see the whole, you, the funk soul uh, jazz that we were familiar with from, say, America and the US, and then being being introduced to this whole other part that had such a big part as well, like back in the day, and it just sort of like meshed together and it just felt right. And I, you know, within eight months I'd, you know, packed my bags and moved over yeah. this way, you know. So I, um, yeah, I was just, I was curious to hear your story about it. Now, what, what is, you've, um, at the moment, so I haven't, I haven't run a club night myself, um, like my own club night for, for years. And we used to obviously do dust and things here. And, yeah. Um, and then we, um, I, I've been involved mostly with venues the last recent years of, of being like programming rather actually putting on club nights as such. Now the BGC has been running for 10 years now, uh, mm. maybe more, I think 11. 11. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I, um, and so you're, you guys have really been at the forefront of, of what's been happening on, on the support and the lack of support in nightlife at the moment. Particularly, you, both because you've been in the UK as well, and and in Beirut. What would you say now? Um, what are some of the ways you and the BGC team are keeping your club night relative, and still in the eyes of your audience and fans? Like, how are you navigating through this? Well, I guess um, I guess we're not really. <laughs> I mean, I guess. <laughs> Obviously, you know, it's been a crazy year. It's been one year of not being able to DJ and open a club night 
uh, which is, you know, it's a long time. <laughs> so, I mean, in the first lockdown, I guess the, the kind of thing that kept us going was like all of the online radio um, shows that we were part of. And I guess that really kind of peaked in the lockdown because everybody was like stuck inside. And I mean, there was Radio Alhada, which, you know, we both have a, a radio show on, mm -hmm. um, which is based in, um, in Bethlehem. And that kind of emerged and I guess kind of connected us all yeah. in the region. Um, so yeah. I guess, you know, what was a kind of fit, a physical music community that we had at the Beirut Groove Collective every week, not, uh, every week on Fridays has become like an online music community. And I guess we've continued to connect that and way. share music through mixes and radio shows and, and you know, that, that kind of way. And I guess just generally, yeah, I've, I've been doing a lot of radio. I've, I have two radio shows a month, one on Radio Ahada and one on um, uh, TWR. But tell, do, tell me, what's TWR? Who are they? It's, it's, it's Totally Wide Radio. Oh, yes. Right, of yeah. course. So okay. It's, um, it's run by Eddie Pillar. Was yes. Founded by oh, amazing. Pillar, amazing. Mm, 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 so it's kind of mm. like Acid Jazz Record mm. Labels radio station. Yeah. But it's, it's a really nice. Oh, that's radio. been around for, for, for a while now. I remember totally, totally, uh, totally wide from early 2000s uh, when I first came across well, it. Well, that, that was an album, but the radio station has oh. only been around one year or two years. Oh, they took okay. Because no, I. Have, acid. That's a jazz album. I, well, no, it must be because I remember uh, Rush Dewberry, was, Rush Dewberry from the Soho jazz. radio before that they were oh, okay. all, all involved in, and Eddie used to have a show there, and so did right. Kev Dar and everybody. Maybe okay. You, do you do you remember Rush Dewberry from Brighton, uh, the the Jazz Rooms? He had a he had a club night um, called the Jazz Rooms in Brighton, and but I remember him on on a radio show in the early two thousands, and I thought it was the same. I thought it was the same one, but anyway, I, I, I could be mistaken. Now, I remember I used to listen to it in the early two thousands, two thousands, and and I got and I remember being introduced to Fat Freddy's Drop for the first time in like two thousand and two, two thousand. I'm I'm hearing a New Zealand band <laughs> off on a UK radio station for the first time. I'm no, like, no. This, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so um, yeah. The 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 the. The rise of all these radio stations, and particularly from the region, which I think has been absolutely amazing, has brought all these new people forward and artists that we've never heard of or of before. Like even yeah. just just um, just music lovers that are and collectors yeah. and artists. Exactly, it yeah. doesn't have to be also DJs. Yeah, you know? yeah, like, and you know, musicians, artists, like mm. anybody who like you know passionate about music exactly. is starting to like, have a show and share things. Yeah. Nice. And I think the, I think this has been like a missing ingredient to the region for a, quite some time. So I think this is probably a, a, a real bonus for for the region. Yeah, it's, I totally agree. It's yeah. connected the region yes. even more. So. I mean, mm. I've always felt like the region is, is really connected, which is nice. And we've kind of worked on a few projects together, haven't we, yeah. between yeah. Beirut and Dubai. And then mm. we have like connections in Jordan and mm. Egypt and, you know, Beirut has always been like that. You've always had uh, musicians and artists and DJs coming in from all across the region, from North Africa, from, you know, Palestine, from mm. everywhere. So, yeah. yeah, I think the radio is a nice kind of um, expression of that and it kind of connects the region further, you know. You really feel like it's a... There's a solid, sense of community uh, now. There's a sense yeah. of community through the region and I think this is actually going to be a great pillar for when things do start to open up, mm. the, the the being able to support regional regional shows and supporting regional tours, like the, all the radio shows can actually like kind of all the radio stations can sort of be part of be part yes, of the touring, you know, like the that supports it's 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 becoming um, yeah, and and that's something. I that, mean, now it's a new platform, right? Yeah, that, yeah. Like, we've got to to kind of add to the live experience because we all miss the live and the physical space of the club. Right. Mm. Like, and that's never going to go away. You're never going to be able to replace that with an online radio station or an online concert, but like it can definitely support that. I mean, now there's lots of exciting ways that you can <clears throat> do, sorry, you can do like live streams, which we've done a few times with the Beirut Groove Collective. We've done like a, a live stream to like radio El Nard, which is another 
Palestinian radio station mm. uh, that started up before Radio Yes, Ohara. yes. Mm. So there's a, there's a lot of nice uh, potential there. I guess just the interesting thing is how is this, if things are kind of shifting towards more like kind of online concerts, online mixes, how is the artist going to be able to make a living from that? Because mm. at the moment it's not really translated into like a monetary value, you know, and it's like, um, you know, you don't want to commercialize these things because part of it is that it's like grassroots and it's built up. But at the same time, I mean, artists need to find a way to, you know, yeah. sustain themselves. So yeah, yeah. it'd be interesting to see how that translates. I think, um, was it Erica Badu who did, um, she's done a few concerts, a live stream concerts during the lockdown mm. and has kind of has done it as a way to kind of pay her own production team and has been charging like, I don't know, 15 pound a ticket or something. And I mean, she can pull off something like that. Yes. Incredibly. Yeah, incredibly yeah, well. yeah, yeah, yeah. She has huge following and she's, you know, incredible, but I wonder if there's potential for, you know, smaller events to also find a way to, to, to do that as well. well I think uh, that's a good point. I think, uh, um, what could be a, a way to right, like you've got, you know, maybe collectively the radio stations in the region can, um, or even even in the, in the individual stations, uh, when they do the uh, festivals, there are ways to kind of raise uh, funds or, mm-hmm. and have, but you need those platforms where uh, people are sort of going into a different experience yeah. uh, uh, where they pay like $10 or whatever to get in to watch that particular weekend's exclusive content. And so you're basically creating online festival type Mm. format. So I guess that's one way of doing it. Um, Definitely. But again, like the infrastructure to set that up, that funding required, it needs, it needs backing as well, you know? Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah, to to build and a it, site. They need to be supported, don't they? All these kind of projects, but um, interestingly, like NT, NTS, you know, the yes. massive um, kind of alternative radio station. And they've just like moved saying, studios like, this week. I saw. Yeah, they've just mm. uh, they've just got rid of their the <laughs> bye bye to their <laughs> old legendary booth. But they've started like a membership scheme where they're asking mm. people to like pay a small amount per month. Yeah, you know, I think loyalty fair, programs like, are. Right. I think loyalty programs are fantastic way to do it. Yeah, and it, the, the community radio stations have been doing it way before pandemic. Um, that's you know you buy a supporter membership for uh, for a station, and you and it could be as little as five dollars a year, or ten bucks a year, or twenty dollars. Yeah, exactly. And you can buy different tiers. It gives you access to certain content, certain prizes. If you're a member, you, you're you eligible to get prizes from the station. You know, mm-hmm. like not not anyone can just ring up and get a the late, like the, the latest giveaway. You have to be a yeah. member to get a giveaway. You know, like there's, and I think that there gives those people those incentives. And you, 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 if you get one giveaway, you've paid for your, your supporter drive, you know yeah. what I mean? So yeah. it's those kind of things are um Way the way community radio stations have been around for years, mm. um, yeah, and I think I think it is a lot. I think it is new territory for the region. Um, yeah, so people are still learning. I think Radio Ahara are doing an amazing job. Um, they've um, they've they've adapting and learning how to kind of like run the station. Like you can see them see them evolving and and yeah, and growing. It's. Yeah. Uh, it's great, and the, the, I think the boys are doing a great job, and the whole team's doing a great job. Yeah, yeah. it's very impressive how they like kind of very quickly built mm. up like a full program. Yeah, you know, very clever. They're connected with everybody across the region, and not limited to the region as well. I mean, it's actually nice to have a home for our music that's based in the region and looking outward rather than all the time radio stations and platforms that are based in Europe or in the States or wherever. And then they like plug back into the Middle yes, East. You know what I mean? yes. It's nice to actually have it centered in, yep. in Palestine. Like, well, the radio partnerships that they're creating have, uh, uh, have been amazing. And even some of the guests that they've had on uh, from, even from different diasporas in other parts of the world and, and just, 
um, and collectors and DJs from, you know, like really big names as well who have, um, who have a passion and love for music in the region as well. And it's, yeah, it, it, I think they're really, really nailing it. They're doing, doing yeah, a great job. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, have you found that your journalism skills are, have really kind of been more of use this year for you? Uh, and yeah, yeah. it's become more like, since you've had to kind of step down from DJing, but now going into a radio presenter f- format more than more than before, yeah. As well as your oh, writing, yeah, mm. I've been completely relying on <laughs> <laughs> and editing and, and whatever else. And that's the good thing about journalism is yeah. that you can do it from anywhere. So no matter the lockdown, uh, I've been working like the last I don't know five six months with um, this British photographer called Rankin. Um, he has a, a magazine oh, no, called, yeah. called Hunger. Mm. Uh, it's like a cultural fashion uh, mm. magazine mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. I've been doing various book projects with them. Um, and I've been doing different projects, articles here and there. Oh, fantastic. Them, uh, coming out on Al Jazeera uh, next week. You've got what's coming out? Uh, an article coming out on Al Jazeera on uh, the Lebanese artist Isen Al Munzi. Okay. Um, who me and Alessa have also been working on a reissue of... Um, uh, one of his records was reissued last year in January, Belly Dance Disco. Yep. Uh, and there's another one coming out in, I think, January or February uh, called Sonatina for Maria. It's his album from 1985. Wow. Is that, is that a Sorry. BBE thing as well? That's BBE, yeah. yeah. But, Fantastic. And, yeah, and, and at the same time working on a few other um, music compilation projects um, with a few other people, so... Yeah, there's things going along, and I think in these um, funny times, you just have to be adaptable, you know, and just do do whatever whatever you can, yeah. <laughs> whatever, whatever you can find. Is I mean, you know, it's a difficult time, obviously, for everybody, um, in terms of like the economy and the lack of jobs around and things like that. So mm-hmm. it's good to good to be adaptable. <laughs> <laughs> and- but definitely, I'm looking forward to. I mean, let's hope that we see an end to this pandemic like you know after the spring or something i'm hoping that actually yeah. we'll be able to go back to being able to do club nights again and nightlife culture can come back because like, mm-hmm. yeah. i really miss it <laughs> yeah tell me about it tell me about it like i i'm missing being able to play music for people and like making people dance that's something yeah, that yeah. yeah i mean it as much as it does serve a purpose for online streams and bringing out content on radio, still being able to share music and connect with people probably a lot more than we did online before. Mm. However, uh, it, nothing beats the experience of playing in front of no, people. <laughs> an actual audience. <laughs> no, you can't and, recreate a dance floor. I mean, no. you know, you have these like Zoom dance parties and it's <laughs> doesn't mean anything. I mean, it's like... <laughs> <laughs> like dancing in isolation. I mean, this is the sign of like really terrible dystopian future, isn't it? Where yeah. We're all dancing in our little boxes, like connecting just online. That sometimes I have that those moments where I think, oh my god, what if this is it? Like, what if yeah. this stays like this? <laughs> that <laughs> scares the it? hell out of me. That just that it thought. Yeah. I was like, all right, time to erase that thought out of my head. And I- it's shifting things in many ways. I mean, you're already seeing, like, I'm reading a lot of articles about how, you know, businesses and offices are trying to kind of downsize their office space mm. and like kind of shift into more remote working and, and home working. And what did I, I read yesterday, which was super depressing, was, a, oh, it was Deutsche Bank. They did a report where they said that people who choose to work remotely, like in the future, um, should pay a tax of an extra 5% for like the luxury of working from home. Mm. <laughs> and imagine they're suggesting that it's the employee who should foot that cost. Never mind that like, you know, all of the big businesses that don't pay taxes in any case and contribute, <laughs> they're asking like, you know, it should go on the worker who's anyway paying extra heating, extra electricity, mm. like all of these things from, you know, not actually having a physical space. Mm. Um, so it's just interesting, yeah, to think how how it how it is actually this like you know extended lockdown period is going to shift things for the 
long haul. But I guess clubbing culture is not going to go away. People are like thirsty for it. That's why you you know you've even in these lockdowns we've been having in the UK like raves popping up like in Manchester different places. <laughs> of course, just can't survive, you know, like without it. <laughs> and, and 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 in Manchester of all places, you know, no surprise. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> I think in the first lockdown, the police shut down like about 500 parties in the wow. city. Wow. <laughs> yeah, no, the UK were not having it, were they? No. <laughs> <laughs> but like, maybe this is one of the positive things is bringing back this, like, which we used to have a very strong kind of like alternative uh, music culture, like, you know, back in the 90s, like yeah. raves that used to yeah. happen in like, you know, abandoned um, farm houses and like, you know, in random places like in Glasgow under the bridge and like everywhere. Mm. And maybe this is starting to come back a little bit because one thing about clubbing culture in the UK is that it's been slowly commercializing and like kind of getting away from its its roots. Mm. And, you know, with the way that um, obviously it's like, you know, a very neoliberal political system that we have at the moment and everything is just about the money. And if a club that's been standing for like 20 years doesn't make money for the landlord who owns the land, then they want to just get rid of it so that they can build a big yep. high rise. Yep. And that's been happening a lot in the UK. So mm, mm. I hope that this will bring a kind of renewed energy to the underground clubbing scene again mm, mm. in the UK and everywhere. Hopefully, I think so. I think I, I, I like to think of this as a, just a total reboot, you know, like as if the whole world is just going through this whole shutdown to kind of come back to, ourselves and come mm. back to the authenticity of things and yeah. as much as possible, you know, with the, with technology and as much as possible with the, the way the world runs now. But I think, I think we've all kind of just been so uh, detached and so distracted and caught up in, you know, just getting so much content out and so yeah. much like, produce, you know, produce, produce, produce. Yeah, exactly. And, and, kind of lost our ways and it seems like we're kind of like getting back. That's why I feel, you know, people are interested to learn about history again, you know, in music, you know, and yeah. Yeah. It's a chance to go slower, isn't it? And reflect mm. and like try to like be a bit critical about how we were living before and yeah. think about, you know, better ways. Maybe, it, maybe we don't need to just constantly bang things out all the time and be working like around the clock. Like maybe we can produce like, you know, slower, more meaningful work. Yeah, instead. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, look, I, I love your approach to 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 goal setting. Um, I mean, while you have uh, dreams and passions for what you do, um, you've been one for not really kind of road mapping or etching out a full on plan. Tell mm. me, tell me more about that. I like, what's your kind of take on the way you kind of like approach your goals? Because I mean. The way I, I mean, that, I don't really have any goals. Like, no, I, I know, I know. Yeah, you mentioned yeah. that, but but <laughs> I was saying like the like because you, you, it's not like you're not you haven't got your hands full. I mean, you're a journalist. You're you're you put on a party. You got a radio show now. It's like you are etching out some kind of like passion of what it is that you love doing. So yeah, how do you kind of like keep on track, or how do you keep on doing? that and keeping aligned with what you love mm. what, what is what's your take on that um yeah I mean I guess it just happens naturally it's like I mean you know I, I was in um, Dubai for a couple of years mm -hmm. when I was um editor of Brown Book magazine and then when I came back that's when I started kind of I you know I I, I go through these periods I do like a kind of full-time hardcore job, like, you know, not even nine till five, like nine till nine. Mm -hmm. And then like, I want to like step back for a bit and then just like get back to like what I'm, you know, passionate about and interested in and just like slow down a little bit. And that's when like, I kind of focus a lot more on like the Beirut Groove Collective parties and, and Jackson and Anessa had not long ago switched it to um, a weekly party. And we really just put a lot into like making it the best party that we could, you know, and just like, you know, routinely like having it there every Friday, like bringing DJs in just like, and you know, some, some weeks will be 
um, slower. Some weeks will be packed, like, but mm-hmm. you just, you know, to have that regularity, like, brings something nice, I think, like, for all the regulars and everything else. Um, but yeah, I guess, I guess I, I don't really like set a plan or a goal or anything like that. Of course, like you have things that you're interested in that you want to follow and like, but I, I guess I just like, I like kind of that to follow what happens, if you know what I mean. I mm-hmm. like to kind of see the adventure of what happens if you just kind of follow down different paths and, mm-hmm. and without any particular plan or direction. Yeah, kind of like aimlessly, but like with some kind of purpose. <laughs> like, well, that, I guess that that is the that is the the goal. The goal is to to be in the moment and be in yeah. that. That's the goal, right? The I goal think that's to, yeah. my general yeah. like approach to life is yeah, just yeah. To, like not to sound like really cheesy, cheesy and like <laughs> cliche, but like I do like to just live in the moment. I don't like mm. to. I've never made a five year plan or like, or thought about, you know, different steps. I've always just been kind of like, what's making me happy right now? Like, who do I want to see? Like Mm -mm. trying to like, I I don't know, just enjoy. Yeah. What's around you straight away. Cause I mean, and anyway, I guess if like, you know, if this pandemic has shown us anything, it's that, you know, you can plan as much as you want, but you know, those (laughs) plans just crumble to like. (laughs) Totally. You know, it doesn't always pay off to like, you know, and even if you plan like and you make a solid, you know, goal approach plan of where you want to be and what you want to achieve, you know, things can change or your interests can change or or whatever else. Mm. So, yeah, I guess I've just always kind of followed like that. But I mean, yeah, one of my goals, let's say, is so just before the lockdown, I guess, last November, we were planning our 10 year anniversary for the Beirut Grief Collective. We had a big party planned. We were, um, we were going to bring, um, DJ Newmark. Oh, wow. I was going to come, excuse me. And, um, and we had like a kind of an exhibition we were planning as well that was kind of related to like Lebanon's nightlife history and whatever else. But then, I mean, you know, the shit hit the fan and, um, you know, there was a really inspiring revolution that started and, you know, then we didn't keep our party going through that because it didn't really feel right. And like, you know, the real parties were like on the street and like music was just coming out, out of that revolution. And then it turned into the pandemic. And then anyway, the long story short, basically we never ended up celebrating our 10 year anniversary. And now we're like, you you mentioned earlier, we're at the 11th year. (laughs) So it's like, uh, 10 plus one. So I would like once all this finishes to like actually do a kind of mark our 10 years, I think. Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> I can't wait. I can't wait. Um, you know, the, the BGC has been good to me. <laughs> that should be a t-shirt. Well, yeah, it's quite amazing how many, like, you know, lifelong friends that have come out, oh, totally. out of the BGC, which is really nice. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. What, so what's, um, so what's next now you've got the, um, you've got the, the, the book coming up. That's been the main focus. The one that's coming, the, the, the chapter that's coming out in January is keeping you busy. Yeah. There's, um, it's an Elman's ears record that's coming out on BBE. That one as well. Right. Okay. Yeah. A uh, couple of music compilations, um, coming out also based on, on Lebanese and Armenian music. And you are, you're working, uh, you're working on those compilations. Yeah. A few other compilations. And they're yeah. not with, they're not with, uh, a, a, big, a, a few different, uh, labels. Yeah. Few, but, amazing. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. So there's a few different projects in the work and, and, um, yeah, from in probably January, we'll be going back to Lebanon finally. Okay. So. <laughs> okay, cool. That's good to know. I'm excited right. to get back. And- yeah. Well, hopefully I can make a trip then as well. But I know, yeah. I, I've, I've known, I've known people ha- from Dubai have been, been going to Beirut. I've seen, seen people making trips. Like I know of. Oh, them. really? Yeah. yeah. Nice. Back and forth. But, um, you know, it's gotten a little bit easier to sort of move around. Obviously we'll, with the measures and regulations in place, but it's, uh, there are ways. Um, um, yeah, yeah, I think now in Lebanon is in a one month lockdown, but after that, probably it's mm. uh, probably preparing for Christmas. <laughs> yeah, <You're> going, <laughs> and what are you doing for Christmas? Are you going to be? Uh, to no, I, I was really hoping to get to Oz to see mum and dad, but um, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, 
However, we're talking about them coming over here uh, around about February, March, and oh, nice. um, they might stay here for a bit. I think um, oh. I think that might actually be easier. And mm. uh, but yeah, that that might be the the way to, way to go. So yeah. yeah so tell, why don't you tell the, uh, the, the, the listeners where they can find um, you and uh, the BGC online? Uh, so I have a monthly show on Radio Ahara. Yep. Uh, which is, I think it's the last Saturday of every month. Mm -hmm. And I have a monthly show on Totally Wide Radio, which is the third Monday of every month. Mm -hmm. And I have a mixed cloud account, Natalie Shooter. And... You can find the Beirut Groove Collective on Instagram and Facebook. Uh, that's about it. <laughs> awesome, awesome, Natalie. It's always a pleasure to uh, chat with you. Oh, it's such a pleasure. I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad we got to to do this as well. It's a, a, also, a good opportunity to catch up as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's been really nice. <laughs> uh, well, thank you, give my love to Ernesto as well. Uh, I will. Do, yeah, yeah, say, give, say give hi. My love to all the Dubai fam. Yeah, we'll do. We'll do. Take care. Take care. All right, hugs. <laughs> Hugs and kisses. Bye, bye. 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 Thank you for listening to Electronic Music Life. What were your thoughts? Please let me know. I love hearing from you. And if you love the show, please share it, follow, and subscribe on your favorite platform. For all things James Locksmith, check out jameslocksmith.net. Until next week, here's to your electronic music life. Much love and plenty of music. 